Hi everyone and welcome back to the Social Work Bubble podcast. I'm your host, Laura, and I practice as a therapist in New York City. I have my bachelor's and master's degree in social work and currently work in an outpatient mental health clinic. Today we're going to talk about the last couple of weeks of my job. When I say last couple of weeks, I, this podcast was actually intended for the end of June and it didn't happen, mostly because of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, basically what was going on was so many of my clients, my high risk clients were having crises all at the same time. This was also around the same time, like four therapists left the clinic, my supervisor and the clinic director left, and I had about 10 million other things going on in my life. But before we dive into all of that, make sure you follow and subscribe to this podcast, like, share, comment, any thoughts below. Now let's get started. So let's rewind. Um, I was pretty MIA and still sort of am on social media lately because work has been insane. My personal life has been insane. And I feel like I always say that, but it's always true. It's really hard for me to get a consistent upload schedule for this podcast when, to be honest, in the middle of all these different crises, it's really not a priority for me. (laughs) So, which sucks because I love doing this podcast, but sometimes you have to give up certain things and certain moments. So, a lot was going on Um, a couple, a few weeks ago now, my supervisor informed me that she was leaving the agency. We had built a really good relationship, and so I was kind of sad. I was sad to see her leave. That was also at the same time that I think like four other therapists were leaving the clinic. So, the agency is part of like a multi-site clinic. Or like there's multiple sites are part of the agency. So at my particular clinic, there was four therapists leaving, which is different than saying, oh, hey, four therapists left the agency. Not such a big deal. But leaving one clinic was like, holy cow, we already had a gigantic wait list for new incoming clients. And now we didn't have any therapists to take on these other clients for the therapists that had left. So there was a lot going on. I had... Um, a high-risk client attempt suicide, and they were hospitalized and were inpatient. There was also child protection involvement because of um, the surrounding situation. I had another client get wrongfully arrested and now is, has all this court involvement. I had three other clients that were high-risk express some very concerning suicidal ideation. They were in immediate crisis, and Then I also had another client attempt suicide and had to get them evaluated at the ER. On top of all of that, I'm not going to get into the details of what was happening in my personal life, but it was one of the most stressful points in my life, I think. And being a therapist... While my whole family is experiencing some very difficult moments, it felt like a lot of people, a lot of people in my family would turn to me for support. So not only was I having to be a therapist for my super hefty 50 person caseload with 15 high risk clients, therapists leaving the agency left and right, clients attempting suicide left and right, hospitalizations, unnecessary arrests. But then in my own personal life, when I was supposed to be clocking out of work and taking a breather, I would have family members constantly call me, asking me different questions or just in crisis themselves. And that was really hard. I remember one distinct moment where, you know, someone had called me, a client had called me and, um, it was, they were in crisis. I had been up late trying to get all my paperwork done, which was like a whole other layer of all of this because I've already been working so much just with my clients and that didn't even include the time I had to do paperwork. So I'd been up all night trying to figure that out. And then I wasn't sleeping well because of, you know, stress. (laughs) And um, I've talked about this before, but I also see my own therapist for depression and PTSD, and so I was also dealing with my own mental health, and I 
went to bed finally. I had a really hard time sleeping, and so I slept until 10 o'clock the next morning. And as soon as I woke up, I woke up because a family member called me in complete crisis, and they just needed to talk. And (laughs) they literally started the conversation with, my therapist didn't answer the phone, so I called you, which no like (laughs) that's not okay if you follow me on instagram this was probably during the time when i made this instagram post and it said remind your family and friends that you're not their therapist too and i don't have any family that follows me on social media because my whole social work bubble brand is a secret (laughs) which is a whole other thing so it wasn't really being passive aggressive but for me it was a learning experience to not only have boundaries with clients in my agency, but to carry that home and to really make sure that I can support my family and I can be there. And you know what? My education will probably inform my response because I understand and I have a better understanding of what their experiences are. However, I'm not coming to them as a therapist. I'm coming to them as a family member and that's it. And anything beyond that is something another professional would probably have to deal with. So as you can see, there was a lot. And today I just wanted to talk about how I got through it. Um, I'm still moving through it. My clients and my caseload has kind of calmed down. I've discharged a couple clients and haven't added any new ones onto my caseload, which has been nice. So it's becoming something that's more manageable. And, you know, things in my personal life are still crazy, but I do feel like through lots of practice in this last month, um, I've really learned a lot about myself and how to move through all of this because it has been very difficult so any insight i can share um i will so basically at the beginning there was a lot of crying i'm a huge advocate for crying i love crying there was a big part of my life growing up where i didn't cry um just some like personal psychology about myself i'm the middle child i was very much I didn't want to be bothersome. I didn't want to be a problem. So I kind of just kept to myself. I was very independent. So I just try to figure things out on my own, right? So there was a big part of me growing up where I never really learned how to regulate my emotions. So I uh, didn't. (laughs) And I really just genuinely would keep it in, even at a very young age. I remember coming home from like kindergarten And I had a really bad day. I think someone was had been bullying me on the bus and I was crying. I was crying on the bus. I was so upset. I was probably five or six years old and I'm walking on the sidewalk only a few feet away from my house. And I remember telling myself at this young age, okay, Laura, don't cry. Everything's okay. Like you don't want to upset mom or dad, right? (laughs) Which is like crazy for a kid to say that. But that's also, I think, a big part of who I've always been is I don't want to be a bother, which now, I mean, unpacking that as an adult and as a therapist and going through college and social work, you see a lot of these, your own patterns, right? You understand your own psychology, your own behavior a lot better. And I think through that, you're able to process your own stuff, which has been really helpful in understanding myself and also in offering support to the people around me and my clients. So now as an adult, I say all that to say I advocate for crying because I never cried as a child. I mean, I did, but I I tried to keep my emotions in so much. And as therapists and social workers, I'm sure we're all familiar in knowing that when we do that, it, nothing helpful comes up, right? Because it builds up and it builds up and then it can just manifest in a really unhelpful or unhealthy way. So if you cry... I think that's good. And now as an adult, I cry all the time. (laughs) I, it's almost become like a running joke because even just like small stuff, like I'll cry at like animal videos now, which I never used to really care about. I'll just like, I'll cry at just everything. I'll cry when I'm happy. I'll cry. (laughs) And because now I'm just like, oh, I just have to express my emotions, which is cool. And I think it's just been such a relief for me to allow myself to be in those feelings and to express them. 
So I cried a lot. With that though, like I've mentioned, I have my own mental health things going on and I do have a tendency to fall into depression and more depressed behavior. And when I say that, I mean sleeping all the time, you know, having really low motivation, really low energy, having a hard time getting out of bed, having a hard time, you know, with daily living activities with um, like cooking my meals, showering, things like that, doing my laundry, keeping my apartment clean, especially when there's a lot of stress at work. And so uh, sometimes when there's a lot of things going on, I end up getting into this cycle of work, sleep, work, sleep, work, sleep. And I could see this pattern happening. And a few months ago, I did do a podcast on burnout because I had been burnt out. I was working at least like 50 to 60 hours a week, maybe more. And there was no time for myself. Basically every waking hour had to do with work, which was worsened by the fact that they was working remotely and it felt like clients had more access to me and I had a hard time implementing my boundaries. And so this time around, because of that experience, I learned from that and I could see this pattern and I saw the signs and the warning signs within myself that I was headed for burnout again if I continued this cycle. So I had to be real with myself and, you know, as a therapist and a social worker, you learn a lot of strategies to support your clients during stressful moments, perhaps when they're experiencing depression or other things going on. And one of the... Um, interventions I like to use is behavior activation. And so a big part of that is basically, to put it simply, breaking things down to be more manageable. So for example, a lot of people that struggle with depression, like the things that I listed, having a hard time getting out of bread, maybe having a hard time cooking meals and showering and kind of doing like those daily living things, we break it down. So it is, so we can still accomplish something, but maybe it doesn't look the way that we thought it would, right? So if you're showering maybe it doesn't mean you're taking like a 15 minute shower scrubbing every inch of yourself you know shampoo conditioner shaving all of this and that because it can become quite a chore you do what you can for yourself that day so maybe it's just like hopping in the shower hopping out maybe it's sitting down in the bathtub maybe it's just splashing water on your face or using a washcloth and doing something like that whatever works for you in that moment And I really had to use that strategy with myself in this last month because everything seemed so chaotic. (laughs) And in my downtime, because I was so overwhelmed, I I didn't want to do anything and I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't. But in those moments when I told myself, you know what, Laura, let's get out of this all or nothing thinking. Yeah, this, this task is really hard, but let's break it down. Let's make it so it's more manageable for you in this moment. When I did that, it was so, I felt so much better, right? Because you feel encouraged when you can actually move forward and accomplish something, even if it's small, and you can build off of that momentum and that motivation to keep on going. So I tried to do that. Um, A big part for me to living in New York City and being very introverted, it's almost like you can get overstimulated very easily. And when you're experiencing high levels of stress, that can really impact that feeling of overstimulation as well. So one thing that I bought probably, I don't even know, last year, the year before, was these Beats headphones, the one that goes over your ears. And it has been one of my best friends while I live in New York City because I don't like noisy spaces. I grew up in a rural area. Like, my neighbors are farmers, <laughs> you know. My grandparents have a farm. They're, like, we're very spaced out. So that's where I grew up. So moving to one of the biggest metropolitan areas was a huge adjustment for me. And a big part of that was the noise and how that impacted my stress levels and a lot of things. So for me, a big part was putting my headphones on and listening to music, or even sometimes just putting my headphones on and not listening to anything, but just having that noise barrier to help with any overstimulation or even just like outside noise. You know, it's almost like when you get to that point where you're so stressed or you're feeling grumpy and one small thing happens and you just explode. A lot of the time, that's the noise for me. You know, if I'm already feeling a little bit stressed and then, you know, like, 
there's constant noise outside my window it really frustrates me so i put my headphones on i've been listening to a lot of calming music um i am a christian and so i have been listening to a lot more gospel music but whatever your beliefs are whatever works for you do it um another thing that i did during this time that with all these things you have to be very intentional with which i think is the hard part and you really have to check in with yourself and be mindful of what's coming up for you um but i commute to work in my car and whenever i would drive home i, I usually get home around nine o'clock and i park and i don't get out of my car immediately because i do think another thing in living in new york city and having a lot of things going on you can feel very like fast-paced on the go 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 all the time and for me i was very intentional with when i got into my parking spot i didn't immediately get out of my car i turned my car off and i just sat there and i closed my eyes for a few moments i had all the music off i had my phone turned off and it was literally just five minutes like nothing crazy um, but just five minutes of calm before i got out of my car i walked to my apartment and there have been some moments where i've intentionally parked a little bit away from my building sometimes it's unintentionally because it's new york and finding parking is insane but i've realized that that walk home even though it's not that long has also been helpful for me which is another thing that i do um i'm a huge advocate of cardio <laughs> um this is mostly for me a big big coping skill i have always used since i was in middle school has been running and cardio and i've noticed that it's really hard for me to do those things when i'm stressed and so again i have to be really intentional and in those moments i really have to push myself to follow through and to do it and so i used to run a lot um, I don't run a lot now. I do a lot of walking um, and different things, do a lot of yoga, and lately I've also been getting into some at-home workouts with like calisthenics and everything. But when I say, I like, I forgot how amazing it feels <laughs> to exercise hardcore because I love walking and I think walking provides me like another kind of peace. But the feeling of intense exercise is unmatched <laughs> especially when you're very stressed and i think i've talked about this before maybe on my burnout podcast but i think a lot of the times i think a lot of the times we want to match the intensity of our experience with an intense coping skill and so i mean like when we are extremely stressed maybe what we need is not something entirely calming, but something equally as intense, like sprinting 10 times somewhere or running up the stairs, you know, something where it can match that. However, there is also um, another kind of coping skill where it's called like opposite action. So when we're feeling some kind of intense emotion, we do the complete opposite, which is where like these calming meditative um, interventions can come into play as well. So it's really whatever works for you. I've found lately intense exercise is what has really been helpful for me. I love walking. Walking in the mornings gives me a sense of peace and calm. Because if I exercise too intensely in the mornings, I kind of just feel kind of off the rest of the day. So I usually exercise more intensely at night. But in the mornings, I like to start my day with a nice calm walk in the local park. And I have my cup of coffee and I'm just enjoying the sort of quiet <laughs> there um another part of how i got through this tremendously difficult time was with my new supervisor i was really nervous about getting a new supervisor i was concerned that the transition would be difficult but she's amazing and immediately i really liked her she provided a lot of good insight and i'm just i'm i'm really happy and i think that was one of my saving graces was just getting someone with a fresh perspective even though i loved my former supervisor and we had a really good relationship i think it's always good to change it up and to have a new perspective to have 
it almost like re-motivates you, right? Because sometimes you can kind of get in the groove with someone, but when it's someone new, you want to impress them or you want to make sure you're doing well. So it's almost more motivating for some people. And just being able to sit and also talk with someone with my clients I've known for a while who they are just now getting introduced with, uh, it was really good to get some feedback, some fresh feedback. So that was really helpful. Um, they offered a lot of support and encouragement. For myself personally, I function best with encouragement and uh, and praise. I'm I really suck, and this is more of like a personal thing I have to work on. I really am not good with criticism. <laughs> um, I'm trying to get better at that because I know that feedback is essential. And I have gotten better at that, but I do really well and feel a lot more motivated with praise. And that's exactly what this new supervisor has given me. And really just that validation that I have a heavy caseload, like to hear that acknowledgement from my supervisor, like, wow, you have a heavy caseload and it's you, I mean, you have phenomenal relationships with your clients and you did this intervention really effectively to hear that really really helped you know because in the midst of a lot of stress and turmoil I think you need that validation to know first it's hard and to have that acknowledgement and second you're doing a great job you know and, and being able to hold both of those things um, another part of what I like to do is planning uh, I I plan a lot perhaps too much, but it's, it's very calming for me. I have my planner, my paper planner for my personal life, the day designer. And on my Etsy shop, I actually came out with something called the Flourishing Therapist Planner. So that's a digital download planner that you can use. And it's for therapists and social workers, others in the mental health field. But it basically has everything you could need to plan out what you need to do in your work life. And I really got into this habit of basically creating a daily schedule for myself. So every night before I went to bed, I would review what the next day would be in the upcoming week. And I write out in detail my to-do list for the next day. And when I say in detail, I mean at the top of my to-do list, the first thing I have to do is wake up. <laughs> Because, you know, that in itself is a success and we're going to celebrate it. So I literally, I'm looking at my planner right now and it says wake up and there's a check mark. So that's good. We accomplished at least one thing today. Um, and I have very much like detailed things on there. And that helps me, you know, walk through the day. Because even in moments where it's like small stuff, right? Like brushing your teeth it still feels like an accomplishment and you're still like, okay, I checked this off my to-do list, go me. And that was really helpful. I also do a lot of journaling. I do a lot of collaging. I write about my feelings a lot. I think this podcast has also been helpful, but you know, in this last month, it hasn't really been a priority. My apologies. Um, and again, uh, I go back to my faith a lot and prayer and finding solace in the church that I attend and my relationship with God. Whatever your spirituality is, um, I would highly recommend to dive into it because I think when we talk about identity, there are many parts of who we are and I think human beings in essence are spiritual beings and I think it's important to tap into that. Whatever your beliefs may be, whatever resonates with you is just another part of our support system and a place that can provide us peace. Um, Another big thing, obviously I also found connection with other people, primarily my partner. We were both going through it. I mean, he was equally involved in this chaos as I was, but to find support and just talk to someone who was also in it, but didn't use me as their own personal therapist um, was incredibly helpful because it can be tricky. I think I, my partner has been very respectful of me clocking out and me being his partner and friend and not his therapist and we have really good boundaries with that it's more my other family members where we have to work on it but it's a tricky balance no matter what and so you know of course communicating that expressing my feelings and just talking things out a million times with him and getting that validation from him as well and just speaking on things 
And then another thing that, you know, I noticed while all this turmoil was going on was I felt like if all of this stuff had been happening a year ago or even a couple months ago, I think I would not have responded as well. I don't know how I would have responded. I don't know how I would have coped with it. You know, you can't guess how you're going to react. But there's something about this time period where I feel more strength and resilience this time. I feel like I know myself better. And I felt almost more at peace moving through this chaos. And looking at who I was even a few months ago, I don't I didn't have that. I didn't have that inner peace. And I think with anything, and this is something I tell my clients as well, if we are so dependent on external things, whether it's people, whether it's our job, whether it's, you know, any kind of situation and we allow that to throw us around, we're able to move through anything for most things if we have this internal eternal internal internal not eternal internal peace and internal strength and resilience now strength does not mean that you're not going to hurt it does not mean you're not going to get upset it does not mean any of those things it just means that you're moving through it right and i think for me one of the biggest parts of this last month even though it was the most stressful month of my life, I am somehow, I'm still in it, but I feel more on the other side of it. And I'm okay. And I mean, there were moments where I was just like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Like, this is a, this is a, an amount of stress that just like, I can't, if I think about it too long, like I can't, like I can't think about what is going on. I can't think about everything that's going on too much or else I'll just like, I'll have a breakdown. And which, I mean, I allowed myself to have those moments too, like crying because it was important. But I cannot recommend enough just this internal peace. However you reach that, I think for me it's taken a lot of time. Um, like I've talked about before and even today, I see my own therapist as well. Um, I try have tried to create a support system that's supportive and to lean on people and healthy and helpful coping skills and I think through all of that that's what's really gotten me to this moment today sitting down and and being at peace and almost in this place of acceptance and I think once you reach that once you have this internal peace the things around you can be chaotic but you will not be swayed by it you know, and again, it doesn't take away the hurt, it doesn't take away the stress or the pain, but you're able to move through it, and that's something I didn't really think I would say about myself, and I think just as much as this experience was difficult, it taught me a lot as a social worker and as a therapist, not only how to meet my clients better where they're at in terms of their stress and anxiety and depression, but also has helped me have these consistent habits to prevent burnout has helped me honestly be a better social worker, to be a better therapist because I've gotten through one of the most stressful times in my work and in my personal life and apparently according to my supervisor I did it well <laughs> so, and to me that means it just feels like I can do anything now it feel, I feel so strong and I feel so capable and just reassured of my skills as a social worker that even in the midst of all of this even though it was messy even though I probably forgot some things and my paperwork was late <laughs> and this and that like I got through it and I'm even more in tune now with my clients I think it was a learning experience for each of these different situations I described with you know, the different suicide attempts, the arrest, the other clients that experienced some very serious suicidal ideation. I think 
I don't know. I don't want to say I'm enlightened, but I do feel that way. I do feel this sense of, wow, I can't believe I, I did that. <laughs> so I don't know if any of this has been helpful because it has been a lot. And I just kind of wanted to come on and talk about my own experience. And, you know, when life is hard, it's okay. And I don't mean that in an insensitive or minimizing way. I'm sure we know as social workers and therapists to allow ourselves to be in those feelings, you know, to allow yourself to acknowledge the hurt, to acknowledge the pain, to acknowledge the stress, and then moving through it. You know, it doesn't mean that you're moving on. It doesn't mean you're just getting over it, right? But every day deciding to do something for yourself that will leave you better off the next day, right? And that doesn't have to be anything extravagant. It is literally, like we've talked about, maybe it's just breaking things down to be more manageable. Maybe it's having just one glass of water that day because you've had 10 cups of coffee and at least it's one glass of water, you know? So it doesn't have to be crazy. But I just wanted to come on here and give any encouragement to social workers that are experiencing tremendous stress because that is in essence a large part of our work is it's almost like I don't know one of the highly talked about topics is how stressful social work is so if you resonate with that I hope that you've kind of taken something from this that even in the most stressful moments with the most crises the most high-risk clients the most the most <laughs> Whatever it may be, it's, it sucks and it's so hard, but you can move through it and it doesn't mean it'll be easy, but just as much as you support the clients, you also support yourself. So again, it's practicing what you're preaching, right? The things that we talked about in social work school... Uh, the things that we talk to our clients about as therapists, do those things for yourself. Use those same strategies, whether it's CBT or DBT or behavior activation or whatever it is. Use those same things on yourself or see your own therapist, you know, but, but you do what you need to do because those moments are hard and it is possible to move through them. So thank you all so much for listening. Um, I know was, I don't know how I feel about today's podcast. It was kind of a lot, but I'm glad that I said it. I think I just, I also needed to do this for myself to almost like process closer to the aftermath um, and really just reiterate the things that I learned, the things that I took away from those moments uh, for myself, but I hope that this resonated with some of you. If you have any comments or you want to share your own experience in the field, whether it's mental health, social work, any psychology, whatever it is, please comment or share on whatever platform you're listening on. You can follow me at Social Work Bub on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. You can check out the Social Work Bubble Etsy shop, where I provide worksheets and activities for social workers, therapists, and others in this field. And also my website and blog, thesocialworkbubble.com. I hope you're all staying safe and I look forward to continuing to grow together in the wonderful field of social work.